Uh, so I'll say uh, a quick introduction and say hello. My name is Lee. I'll be working as the tech director and uh, moderator for this evening's chat. Uh, welcome to Manuscript Monday, uh, presented by the Manuscript Society. Thanks for joining us online. We're uh, uh, very excited to have you all here for this wonderful lecture with Jay Guidemore. Um, so a few housekeeping notes. Um, you'll see, I know everybody's, I'm sure, a pro at Zoom at this point, but you'll see a chat box um, in their webinar chat. You can say hello to everyone, and uh, so we encourage you to just give us, give us a hello and say uh, where you're joining us from this evening. And then you'll also notice a Q&A box below that, um, and that's where we're going to direct our questions uh, from the lecture there. We're going to uh, pause at the end for a little Q&A, but during the lecture, feel free to put uh, those those questions in uh, as they come to mind, um, and we'll have some time after to answer that. But uh, for now, you'll direct any other comments to the chat box there. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and drop my email and my phone number in here uh, for tech support if anybody has any trouble viewing or hearing uh, any of us there. Uh, this is my cell and my email on here. So if you have any trouble, feel free to shoot a text or an email over, and I'll be uh, managing the tech support side of that as well. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and advance to our uh, next couple of slides here. And we'll say a quick note about the Manuscript Society and who the Manuscript Society is and are. Uh, so the Manuscript Society is a 501c3 organization that is open to everyone who is interested in collecting, researching, and preserving manuscripts and documents both in America and abroad. Members include people just like yourselves, uh, archivists, collectors, dealers, and researchers. Uh, we encourage you to take a look at the Manuscript Society website, uh, manuscriptsociety.org, to learn more about the organization. And so that's our quick note here. And then that'll bring us into our presentation for tonight, uh, which is with Jay Guidemore here. Thanks for joining us, Jay. Uh, this is, uh, we welcome uh, Jay Godmore, the Marion Mar Mar and Alan McLeod Director of Special Collections at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. Uh, he'll be discussing building the newly established Virginia Women's Writers Archives at the SWEM Library Special Collections, uh, where he served since July of 2013. He is, has 25 years of experience as an archivist and special collections librarian, having worked in various positions at the Library of Virginia, Brown University, and UNC Chapel Hill. He has an MA in history from Old Dominion University and a Master's of Library and Information Sciences from the University of South Carolina, Columbia. Uh, from 2015 to 2021, he was a member of the Virginia State Historical Records Advisory Board and currently serves as a president of the Williamsburg Historic Records Association and tr a trustee of the Manuscript Society. Uh, we'll get a couple of more notes about Jay's next steps and so he'll be hosting, uh, visiting women writers and uh, sponsoring an annual library for the children's book authors. So we'll hear more about that a little bit after the talk. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn this over to Jay, and uh, uh, I'm just going to step to the background here. Thank you, Jay. The floor Thank is you, all yours. Thank you, Appreciate it. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm really glad to be here tonight. Uh, thanks for attending. Um, first of all, I'm going to give you an overview of the Special Collections Research Center at William & Mary. Uh, we have a uh, very rich and uh, strong collection in, in a variety of different areas. Um, we have about 50,000 rare books, volumes, uh, including a first edition of Isaac Newton's from Kippia from 1687, two first editions of the, of the Book of Mormon, second largest collection of books on dogs in the country, and the largest collection in the United States of four-edge painting books, including 712 volumes. Um, we also have the University Archives and Special Collections. And this includes materials from the founding of the William & Mary in 1693 to the present. These materials include artifacts, publications, photographs, AV materials, prints and drawings, and architectural records. We have materials such as the president's records from the founding to the present, faculty minute books, board of visitors minute books, student organization records. And we're also actively collecting electronic records, born digital records, uh, so we've been harvesting websites, collecting digital photographs, as well as preserving email. Um, one of our strengths of our collection is our manuscripts collection. We call it the manuscripts collections. Not, every, not all of them are handwritten. 
but it's primarily relates to materials that are non-government related or non-university related. And these include letters, diaries, journals, ledgers, business and organization records. The collection strengths are the papers of, of the first white families of Virginia. Our, our library's namesake, Ergwig Sim, is uh, very diligent, very diligent in reaching out to families throughout Virginia and collecting their papers. Uh, we have women's diaries from around the United States, not just those of um, prominent women, but just regular everyday women, teachers, um, housekeep, uh, keepers of their household, and so forth. We also have the di diaries and letters from travelers, missionaries, and business people that traveled to other parts of the country, or other parts of the world, and kept diaries of their travels or wrote back to their family about their experiences traveling. We also were actively collecting letters, diaries, and photographs of U.S. military veterans. And we have materials from, from the French and Indian War um, all the way to the current War on Terror. And finally, Virginia women writers, um, the subject of this talk. Um, this talk, uh, this collection really began um, one of the areas, one of the another area that we collect are distinguished alumni papers, such as sec former Secretary of Defense Robert Gates, Linda Lavin, Glenn Close, Bill Lawrence, Karen Hall. Um, notable alumni that have made um, contributions to society. And as we started hosting book talks, uh, with prominent alumni authors and also holding a children's author breakfast on during homecoming weekend to get that uh, family of alumni, their, their, their children to a, a place to attend, to have breakfast and hear some children's authors talk. We realized that there were a lot of alumni authors that William Mary has produced, um, best-selling novelists and uh, award-winning authors of children's and young adult books. These include C.C. Bell, Alexander Bracken, Catherine Erskine, Fiona Davis, Michelle Gable, Padma Vinkatraman, and Anne Marie Pace. And during each of these books talk, book talks or children's author breakfast, I would approach them or other people would approach them and ask them about preserving their literary archives and us providing, providing a home to document their career, such as rough drafts of their work, um, galleys, advanced reading copies of their books, things that writers in general, especially current William Murray students would want to see to uh, explore the creative process of their work and to see that not everything is just automatically published and printed, that it takes a process and time to actually do um, and create something um, that gets published. Um, but the main impetus for the Virginia Women Writers Archive was a bequest from a descendant of Molly Elliott Sewell, who was born in Gloucester County, Virginia. And uh, her father was a uh, nephew of President John Tyler. And in the late 1800s, in the early 1900s, she was a noted novelist, essayist, and short story writer. The will was received by William Mary um, just unexpectedly. They didn't know the bequest was coming. It was a holograph will. And all it stipulated was that um, the funds provided by this bequest needed to be used to support and document and promote Virginia women writers. My dean uh, of libraries, Carrie Cooper, talked to me about this archive and, and, and told me that she wanted to help. She wanted to build a, an archive that would be the research destination for anybody interested in Virginia women writers. So I was tasked with building this archive. We did have materials already for Virginia women writers, as I mentioned, some of the authors previously that we had collected, um, but there weren't a lot of stipulations. And I realized that there, if you really wanted to create a research archive, we couldn't just create, we couldn't just collect first edition books or books published by Virginia women writers. And uh, those aren't gonna create a, a destination for a research archive. It needed to be something that was um, research worthy for people to come visit. And because there were no stipulations, we decided also to, to collect any Virginian women who wrote letters, diaries, kept memory books, 
maybe wrote poetry, um, but never had it published. And also, since Molly Ellett Sewell made, while she was born in Gloucester County, Virginia, she made her mark in Washington, D.C. and other areas of the country. And um, we decided that the archive would include as anyone who was born, lived, studied, or wrote about Virginia. And this would give us a broad ability to collect a bunch of different women writers. For instance, Willa Cather, um, she was born in Virginia, but she made a mark in the Midwest and other writers um, that would be of interest. Edna Lewis, she wrote some cookbooks about African-American cooking soul food, and she made a mark in other areas of the country. Charlotte Zolotow was born in Norfolk. She was a children's author. I um, mean, she's a children's edit, uh, um, children's book editor and author, but she was born in Norfolk, only lived here for a few years before she moved. She made a mark in New York. And so we had a very broad interpretation of who was a Virginia Moon writer and the types of materials we could collect. It also made sense to collect things other than just authors because then um, it would it would encompass everyday people, people who may have been writing, writing letters to family or just keeping a, a journal of their everyday activities. And as we all know, um, it's the uh, social life of the United States that's so important to collect. The, the women who are notable authors, they probably have, uh, they had the foresight to collect, to keep the materials that they're collecting or writing, you know, draft, rough drafts and so forth. Um, but regular day people and their families may not have the foresight to do that. And so we want to preserve that stuff and keep it collected. Other writers include Rita Mae Dove, Catherine Ann Porter, because she taught at UVA as a visiting author. Nikki Giovanni, who wasn't from Virginia, but is a professor, at, uh, a longtime professor at Virginia Tech. Um, so in addition to letters, uh, uh, journals, diaries, memory books, scrapbooks, photographs, and so forth, artist books, and literary archives, we also make an effort to not only collect, we, you know, we do want to collect first editions of books, first printings. We also want to collect special lim limited edition of books. Anything that may have been annotated, um, signed, um, and inscribed to individuals, um, anything that shows the creative process. Also, artist books. Amy Joyo is a book artist from Petersburg, and she's created some books. They're typically autobi autobiographical, but it has a lot of press printing, handmade paper, special bindings. Um, because and, and also the 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 gist of the of the archive. The most important part, though other letters, journals, diaries, and memory books kept by those writers, those Virginia women who were writers but weren't published authors. Just to give you an idea of some of the things, uh, Lee, I can't seem to... There we go. One of the more notable books we received were Jamie Parker, The Fugitive. It was actually published before um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, but it was about a, an escaped slave. And it was written by Emily Cath Catherine Pearson in 1851. And um, she, um, Emily Catherine Pearson was actually a teacher um, at, a, at a plantation in the Northern Neck, it is now uh, up near where um, Tappahannock, close to Tappahannock is. And she wrote a book, a novel about this. Here's the title page right here. Next slide. I can't seem to change it. Yeah. But I was offered to this by a dealer and it's an actually annotated copy. And while I, I love rare books, I'm not really a rare books librarian. And my favorite rare books are like our, a copy of Isaac Newton's from Kippia that's been annotated. Uh, by the donor, uh, Reverend Thomas Savage. Also, uh, a first edition uh, or a first edition of Tucker's Black Sun was a manuscript by, written by St. George Tucker. So it's rare books <laughs> mixed in with annotations, notations, um, different things that show the creative process. And these are basically different things that... Um, next slide, please. The show the annotations. And this book uh, is actually a copy of Emily Catherine Pearson's 
it's her this is her transcriptions her annotations of this book and what she's doing is she's making corrections in this book in preparation for a for a sequel to Jamie Parker that was published later in her life so she took one of her copies of Jamie Parker and she started making annotations next slide please and you can see where she's writing out uh different text crossing out text crossing out words changing certain things and giving an idea of uh you know how she's going to create this the, the the sequel and this stuff is really important uh to save it shows the creative process students really like this we host almost 50 undergraduate classes a semester including creative writing classes and students really like to see that not everything's done perfectly the first time that it takes time to create something next slide please and here are some more annotations. We're actively digitizing materials. Uh, our digital um, services librarian digitized these few pages for me for this talk, but we plan to have this book available online because we know not everybody can visit, visit Williamsburg and look at this material. So next slide, please. And here are some more annotations. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful example of uh, annotated books from authors and how um, how authors do their work. Next slide, please. Um, but to me, the most important part of this collection are some of the diaries and letters that we have. So Cordelia, Cordelia Meanly, um, otherwise known, more uh, known as Cordy, she lived in New Kent County uh, before the Civil War. And she kept a very, uh, very detailed diary of her experiences living in New Kent County and later Richmond during the war. Um, typical um, young girl. Next slide, please. This is actually previous. Keep you can previous slide, please. I'm sorry. This is a photograph. Photographs of her. She ended up marrying um, a, a Mr. Banks from uh, Williamsburg, and they owned a hotel here in Williamsburg. The picture on the right that you see is actually her at the Raleigh Raleigh Hotel, um, and later in life. And the picture you see on the left is actually when she. Uh, during while she kept the diary. Next slide, please. You can see the detailed notes, you know, the handwriting. Uh, the, 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 the diaries include two volumes, one kept between uh, in the year of 1862 and the other one from 1863 to 1871. Um, she was very, um, kept a diary for the first, the first volume was a very detailed diary from 1862. And she religiously wrote into it every, every day. She talked about meeting um, Confederate soldiers while she was in New Kent flirting. Um, she talked about their appearances, whether they were nice, funny and so forth. Um, but there was also discussions of the war. Next slide, please. And in this particular instance, she's, he's, she's talking about the surrender of the Union forces at Harpers Ferry, um, 13,000 prisoners. She was very much of a supporter of the Confederacy. Um, and she talked about Stonewall Jackson and, and capturing all the prisoners. Next slide, please. This is the second volume of the book. And it was actually a, um, it was just a, a, a regular book. Um, and you can see, next slide, please. This was given to her by a Confederate soldier you know, who said he stole this book for you. I think of you, think of me whenever you open it. So shall I being in such heavily sanctuary as your thoughts. And it just shows the um, compassion and the different things that were happening between uh, women um, home li living at home and also the Civil War soldiers. Next slide, please. Some more detail. Uh, one of her uh, ex uh, most interesting entries, if you're interested in the Civil War, next slide, please. This is where she 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 talks about one of the uh, um, uh, Jeb Stuart being mortally wounded up around Ashland, which is near Williamsburg, uh, excuse me, Richmond, and talks about him, uh, you know, him him dying and his gallantry. Next slide. So the diaries are really detailed um, and very important. As you can imagine, the handwriting is sometimes difficult to read. Uh, current students today, they would probably think that was a foreign language. 
Um, so we're working with uh, volunteers who can read handwriting and so forth that will have that uh, those diaries um, digitized as well as made available electronically. Um, for those who don't know, uh, Lady Astor, Nan Nancy Witcher, Langhorn Astor, Viscountess of Astor of Great Britain. Uh, she married uh, an Englishman. She was born and raised in Virginia around Danville. And she was the first woman member of the British Parliament, Parliament and served from 1919 to 1945. And um, she uh, is a, a one, we have a number of letters of her. And this is a letter that we acquired as part of the Virginia Monroe's archive. And it's a letter she wrote to uh, uh, T. Lawrence. Uh, I'm sorry, Lawrence of Arabia. And it talks about, uh, it's in response to Lawrence of Arabia saying that they're very wealthy, wealthy may buy my book, but they may not want to read it. And and then uh, Lady Ash is telling uh, Colonel Lawrence that, you know, I am one of the people who are very wealthy and would like a copy of your book, but I don't promise to read it. Uh, they ended up becoming great friends. Um, and, you know, she attended um, his wife's funeral and so forth, and they became great friends. But these are the kinds of uh, interesting materials that really shows the compassion and personalities of people um, that publish works and, and books just don't. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned, uh, I was a descendant of Molly Elliott Sewell. She lived from 1860 to 1916. She was born in Gloucester County, Virginia. Um, made her, her father died when she was uh, relatively young. She made her mark in D.C., Washington, D.C. Um, she was an anti-suffragette, and she wrote some essays about that. Um, but she was a very noted novelist, short story writer, and essayist in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, we have her diaries. We also have other, other other letters she wrote. Next slide, please. This is a letter that she wrote in 1899, and um, I'm not sure who she's writing it to, but what's interesting about this is that she wrote materials, um, letter, you know, she's talking about, uh, next slide, please, writing the um, dialect of African-American vernacular, um, which really tells you how she how she created her work and and how she wrote those kind of uh, language that were in the books, which are very valuable for researchers. No biography of her has been written. I mean, other than the smaller ones. So this would be uh, some interesting materials for any biographer that would be interested in there. Next slide, please. You can hear, um, you know, she definitely had um, typical Southern uh, racial attitudes. And she talks about, um, again, about how she portrayed African-Americans in her writings. Next slide, please. And this is a picture of her as well and um, her signature as well. And her handwriting is a little bit more difficult to to read. Uh, so it, it will be very nice to have some of these digitized and, um, dig, uh, digitized and transcribed so we can do some uh, text mining and, and do some OCR um, or some uh, keyword searching to make a search across things. Next slide, please. Catherine Sims Powell. The Powell family, uh, they ran a girl's school in Winchester, Virginia. Um, I think he was a lawyer. When the, when the Civil War broke out, he went to Richmond to work for the Confederate government. Two of the sons died very early in the war. Some of the um, the sisters, there were like three or four sisters, and they were spread among Virginia and wrote letters back and forth to each other. And we've had these letters for quite a while. Um, the Powell family, um, are, uh, Catherine Hepburn descends from them, and some of her materials were donated from her estate when she passed away. But Catherine Sims Powell was the aunt of um, the patriarch of the Powell family and um this is a letter that she wrote to her daughter ellen in 1861 uh 1862 i think right and uh, i'm sorry 1861 next next slide please and it's a it's a wonderful letter it's about um miss powell what mrs powell was living in alexandria at the time and she talks about 
that her da she was glad to hear that her daughter had was able to get away from the Union invading forces. And she talks about the um, anxiety of being occupied by Union forces. Next slide, please. And some of the wonderful handwriting that you see. It's really a, a lost art. I really sometimes wish with all the email we're dealing with that we're, we'd go back to writing letters. Next uh, slide, please. And here she's talking about um, just different things, getting, you know, the um, the different nephews and family members she had that she had that was serving in the Confederacy. Obviously, she was very proud of them um, and some of the privileges that they had and the rumors they were hearing about what was going on with the war. Next slide, please. This is the last page. Um, just a wonderful um, uh, letter of the Powell family where a lot of women in the family uh, wrote, were, were wonderful letter writers and wrote back and forth. Next next slide. Now, this is probably one of the, my favorite items in the collection, the Florence Barber diary. Now, Florence Barber, when this diary was acquired, it was believed to be from an African-American woman living in Portsmouth, Virginia. And um, Jody Allen of the Lemon Project which is William Mary's effort to explore our connections to slavery uh, and, and our connections to um, our support of uh, segregation, had an, an, a, a student intern <laughs> begin transcribing this diary and to try to determine who wrote this diary. And what the student discovered was that this woman was a teacher and was married to a doctor. And by looking at some of the names that were mentioned in there and doing some genealogical research, she discovered that this diary was actually the diary of Florence Barber, who was the wife of a doctor in Norfolk, Virginia, and served as a teacher and was a teacher. It's a diary, a daily diary from 1902. Um, obviously, it says 1901, but it was 1902. And most of the entries are very basic. Um, talks about the weather, what she did on a regular basis, um, certain things that she did, um, going to church, teaching, the different people that she saw, uh, people and family that she helped. Um, but what's interesting about Florence Barber is that once the students started doing more genealogical research on Florence Barber, the student discovered that Florence Barber was actually the granddaughter of Solomon Northup. Uh, of 12 years a slave and that the child, if you've seen the movie 12 years a slave, the child held at the, at the end of the book held by um, Solomon Northup's uh, son may have was, was either Florence Barber or her brother. And so the connection to this is amazing. And um, we've had family members, relations of Florence of Solomon Northup, travel all the way down to Williams, William and Mary in Williamsburg to see the original item, to touch the original item, even though we have it digitized and it's available online. And uh, next slide, please. You can see from here, the link there will take you to a freely accessible copy of this diary on the previous page. And there's just different, different entries that she was keeping um, of the diary. And this is a really an example. You think about the Cordy Meanley diary, Catherine Powell, um, you know, the Molly L. Sewell letter and the um, Lady Astor letter. Those are all typically somewhat prominent white women. Cordy Meanley was not necessarily very prominent. She was not as well known as Catherine Powell or obviously Molly L. Sewell or Lady Astor. Um, but Florence Barber being an African-American woman from Norfolk in the late 1800s, early 1900s, I mean, she was very unknown. And that's the importance of this collection is that we aren't just interested in the most prominent people in, in you know, in, that, that are out there. We're interested in collecting uh, and documenting women from all aspects of life and not just the most prominent people. Next slide, please. And just some more of the same. Um, this is one of the diaries that when we pull up class, we, we show it to classes and open houses very much so. Um, just to show that, you know, we're not just collecting the prominent people. We aren't just collecting white families anymore. 
that we definitely want to diversify our holdings and collect all aspects of society uh, and our, our culture. Next slide, please. Here's just some of the uh, resources you can see um, if you're interested. If you go to our website at Special Collections Research Center, um, it'll give you a, a Google search box. It'll it'll say collection guides. That'll be searching um, archives and manuscript finding aids. Um, you also have um, a search bar for rare books. So you can search our rare books collection and the digital archive where you can search the, like the Florence Barber Diary and so forth. Um, one of the things I relied on when I first started it was this, was trying to compile a list of Virginia women. Excuse me. Who were these Virginia women? I mean, who were the authors that we had? I mean, I know we're not just collecting authors, but we wanted to have a, a full list. And um, Randolph uh, College, Randolph Mankin College, uh, was very active in collecting writings of Virginia women uh, very early on with published material. So we're a lot of material like that. Um, I built the collection um, by identifying the authors identifying women who lived in Virginia, searching AV books for Virginia women, Biblio, Via Libri, um, going to Rare Book Hub and looking at the catalogs and so forth, um, reaching out to uh, manuscript dealers that I knew, tell them what I was looking for, um, especially for those dealers that I know um, seem to have a lot of Virginia-related materials and said, well, we're not just collecting authors and literary archives. We also want letter writers and diary writers and so forth. Um, I've been pretty good luck to acquire that material. We also are very actively acquiring donations, accepting donations from these Virginia women writers. Um, the next steps in the archive, as we as we continue to build it, we're looking to um, support Virginia women writers. So in the coming months, we'll be offering uh, vis visiting writing fellowships, uh, visiting writing uh, writers will come to campus work with students on creative writing or writing workshops, uh, work with the community, uh, and also allow us to work with them on preserving their archives. Um, a lot of stuff, a lot of writers now, they don't keep hard copy manuscripts. They don't keep notebooks. They do a lot of stuff on the computer. And I don't know how you are when you write, or if you're a letter writer or even a writer of anything, you would... Um, just overwrite what you wrote the day before and not keep the previous editions, previous copies. And so we want to work with these writers to save their previous copies. The other thing we're doing is that we, uh, next slide, please. Is that, uh, no, previous slide. Um, we are uh, partnering with the Library of Virginia in Richmond, Virginia, who offers a Virginia um, Authors Awards and we are co-sponsoring um, a Children's Literature Award um, this year and in the future. So self-nominations are accepted. If you were a Virginia author that wrote children's books and you are, have a connection to Virginia, you can nominate yourself, nominate others, and we, we want to support those writers in their future endeavors. And... Um, we're hoping that that will give us an opportunity to work with these authors as well, perhaps preserve their uh, archives and grow the Virginia Women Writers Archive. So that's that's the Virginia Women Writers Archive. Um, thank you very much for your time. I'm pleased to take questions um, if you have any. Thanks so much, Jay. That was fantastic. Um, yeah, for all the folks joining us online, um, you'll see a Q&A box there. Feel free to type in there. Uh, I see one here from Roger Moore to get us started, and he asked, uh, how much of the collection is digitized or has been digitized? Yeah, you know, um, everybody wants things digitized. Digitization is not just putting it on a scanner or, or photographing it, imaging it, and making it available online. It requires metadata, making sure you have the right system to display this material so very little of this collection has been digitized however we are very actively digitizing more and more stuff more and more materials if a patron contacts us 
Roger, if you contacted us and said, I want to see Jimmy Parker digitized, we would put that in the queue to have it digitized, and then we would make it freely available to everybody after you requested it. So we'd send you a copy for your research use, and we would make it freely available. So the Cordy Meanly Diaries, some of these letters that we have, um, we are actively working to digitize more and more. But at, the, at this point, it's very low percentage of how much is digitized. Good to know. Um, and a, a couple other questions that had uh, come up uh, just ahead of time. It says, uh, where do you search for manuscript materials to add to this archive? And you might have covered some of that already in this talk. But if you could further elaborate. Yeah, for one of the things that was interesting is that uh, um, we acquired the literary archivist Charlotte Zolotow. I mentioned her previously. And uh, uh, that was really just me going on EB Books and Biblio.com and just typing in Virginia women and seeing what kind of manuscripts were out there. Um, and also identifying authors uh, or, or, or people you knew um, who lived in Virginia and just searching their name in some of these databases and seeing if things pop popped up, seeing if archives were located elsewhere and if they weren't. Uh, for instance, there's, there's a dealer in Richmond that deals with a lot of Virginia manuscripts, and we were able to acquire the manuscripts of Akila Matthews, who was a, a, an African-American woman in Danville. Um, during World War II, and there was a lot of letters that she had written her, 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 her sons who were serving in the war. Um, so it just it really just looking at biblio.com, uh, AB Books, Via Libri, uh, reaching out, looking at catalogs at Rare Book Hub, uh, making, um, talking to the dealers you know, um, that, hey, we're looking for this item. And, you know, dealers... They're really a collaborative bunch. They're all trying to make a living, but they're very a collaborative bunch. And they would put me in touch with others that may have material or say, hey, I hear you're collecting this stuff. And also we have a very active library board. Um, and also my staff are very wonderful where they become, in, they become aware of authors that or, or, or women in Virginia that may have materials and they'll, they'll alert me to something or they'll be like, oh, did you know about this writer? Did you know about this person? There's some letters here and they may go to an estate sale and see something and, and put me in touch. So it's always just getting the word out and, and, and trying to do that as much as possible. Fantastic. Yeah, we'll we'll um, drop a link in uh, in a follow up email. We'll add some of these uh, these resources there. So that way everyone can can access that the library for William Mary there or um, in the collections of writers by Virginia women uh, at the Randolph College link as well. Um, we got another quick question from Brad Cook that asks, uh, Jay, what is the oldest item you have in your collections related to the history of William and Mary? We have um, related to the history of William and Mary. We actually have a plaque from the 1670s where it was the original land of the college. Um, it was called the Ballad Plat. It was actually the uh, Ballad was the gentleman who either sold or donated some of the land that he had. But the actual, the oldest artifact we have related to William Mary is we have two boundary stones that uh, that um, were the markers for the, for the college lands. Um, and they were found um, one of them is on display in our lobby area, and the other one is stored in our stacks. Uh, but it has the William Mary cipher. It has the year 1693 on it. And uh, and, and if anybody knows Williamsburg or William Mary, there's a, a lake there, Lake Matoka. And a gentleman, uh, one of our students, uh, did some scuba diving in Lake Matoka because he swore that there was another boundary stone in there, and he had the ability to lift it up, but he couldn't find it. It's a lot of muck. Uh, it's more of a swampy area that just sort really of got filled in with water. So the boundary stone is our um, earliest. Now, in terms of handwritten documents, we have a contemporary copy of the charter. Our original charter disappeared after the revolution, but we have a contemporary copy of the charter from 1693. Um, so the handwritten documents from there. And our earliest faculty minute book, we've had several fires in our history. The earliest faculty minute book is from 1729. Um, and um, some of those things. So we do have some early records uh, that are handwritten, which are really nice. Very exciting. Well, thank you, Jay. If there's anything else, um, feel free to drop in that Q&A box, but I believe we'll start to wrap it up here and wanted to say a quick thank you um, to our presenter, Jay Guidemore. Uh, you can learn more about um, 
the well, like I said, we'll send out some of the resources there. You can follow up there. Um, I dropped a link in for the uh, the Children's Literature Awards there into the chat if you want to follow up and uh, check that out as well. Um, we'll of course uh, encourage you all to visit our manuscriptsociety.org uh, to learn more about the society and what we're up to. And the next talk that uh, we'll have here uh, will be the first of the month as we're doing first Monday of the month here and that will be on May 6th and our uh, speaker for that one let me pull this up here um, if you'll join us next week and you'll register the same way that you did for this one just on manuscriptsociety.org uh, under the events ta tab and you'll see manuscript Mondays there uh, we'll do the same registration for that and then yeah this Monday May 6th Coming up next month uh, with Susan Leahy, we'll be speaking about the original Wikipedia, the 18th century Chinese emperor Kuilong's Siku Quanshu project, um, and learn about that and what that entailed. So thank you all for joining us, and uh, we hope to see you next week. Again, this, this uh, will be archived as well on the Manuscript Society website, and uh, we encourage you to check that out. So thank you all so much for joining us, and we will see you next time.